All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our session, Rites of Passage, How Teachers and School Leaders Can Advance Educational Equity. My name is Bryant Best, and I'm from the Council of Chief State School Officers. Uh, my colleague, Don Savisky, is from the Center for Secondary School Redesign. And today, we wanted to have a conversation um, about some critical and key questions. So first, we wanted to say, uh, well, first, we wanted to do introductions, and then followed. Um, we'll have a conversation about what we mean by equity, how we can advance equity in the classroom, and what resources are available for this work. So Don, do you want to take us through a quick introduction? So what we were hoping to do, and we have a large group, and we have a space concern here. We have timing concerns here. Uh, equity was an experience that Bryant and I both went through in Denver in June with an INA call invitation only, and it was deep, intense, and it has refocused uh, my career. This is year 44. It has refocused my career because we're not doing it. We're paying lip service to it. And I'd like you to do a little reflective piece right now. If you had to have six words to describe yourself, six words that were goal-oriented, six words that were your mantra, six words that described your mission in life, what would they be? Six words, put them together. I'm gonna pick on different people to share. Not everyone, we don't have time for that. But I got a smirk back here from a gentleman in a tie and a laggard around. Sir? Smirk. Six words that maybe describe you. You were laughing, you were, you, you were saying, oh, I've got six words, but I don't dare to share them. past six, but you did good. Thank you very much. Sir. Me. Um, this is really hard. I don't know. Um, I'll come back. Yeah. Does somebody have one they'd like to share? Yes, ma'am. I got it in seven. All right, that's close enough. Uh, enter to learn, go forth, to serve. Say it louder. Enter to learn, go forth, to serve. Oh, cool. I like it. I like that. Someone else? Brian, do you have one? Oh man, see, I was thinking of a story. Um, uh, passionate, um, inquisitive. Um, I would like to think myself as thoughtful. Um, did somebody say it's more than six? It definitely was. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, th th those would be the ones I would focus on. How about you? Okay. The whole idea of reflecting back on what you really are is what this whole workshop is going to be about and what we hope you take with you to conduct workshops where you go. We're going to give a booklet out that was the Ina Call Equity booklet that caused all kinds of conversations with us. The six words I share with you right now, I stole. I was in a workshop. And I heard this one, and I said, it, it has become my mantra. Be bold, be kind, be awesome. As a dad, as a grampy, and as a change agent, you have to be bold, you have to be kind, and you gotta be awesome. You gotta help people everywhere we go. So for an introductory exercise, see if that one could pan out in your presentations, in your team meetings as an icebreaker. Brian? Sure. Thanks, Don. So we're here to talk about equity. But before we give you what we presented, I really want to engage. Uh, like I said in my introduction, I'm an inquisitive person. And I want to know what you all think. You all are the teachers, you're the school leaders, you're the folks on the ground. So you tell me, what is equity? Just go ahead and shout it out. Providing students what they need. 
Can you say it a little bit louder? Providing each student with what, with what they, they need in order to be successful. I like that. Mm -hmm. Opportunity and access. Opportunity and access. Great. All shareholders have a voice. Can you say it again, please? All shareholders have a voice. I like that one. Mm. I like that one, too. Um, the ability to provide my students with the best resources, not that my district can buy, but what the best district can buy. Mm. I like that. You know, th that, that last one, I think, really touched on something for me. Um, how many of you have seen this photo before? OK. Um, or at least some variation of it, right? Um, I think when this photo originally came out, um, it was the difference between equality and equity. Um, if you notice in the equality photo, um, each uh, child um, gets one box, regardless of how tall they are, right? And coincidentally, they've all elected to use their boxes to see over the fence and get an opportunity to uh, see beyond their original horizons. In the equity slide, we have the tallest child who actually doesn't even need a box to see into the, into the horizon, uh, he's given his box away to the shortest child. Then we have reality, um, which I think all of us can agree we've seen in, in some way, shape, or form where the student who doesn't necessarily need all of the boxes or all of the resources, having ample resources and ample opportunities to see beyond that horizon and then you have some students who are barely making it, and then unfortunately some students who it seems like it's darn near impossible uh, to get there. How many of you came to this session because you're frustrated with this sort of reality in education? Do, do I have a, a brave soul in here that wouldn't mind lifting up a story um, about why you're so passionate about equity? and what it means to you on a personal level. So I saw in the back, please remember to speak loud so we can hear you. That's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, on a very personal level, I teach at Hall High School, which I also graduated from, and we are on academic distress right now. Um, on a personal level, I come from generational poverty, and I was in foster care in high school, um, although obviously I'm growing in education work much harder to seek those opportunities that a lot of my peers were automatically given. And working at Paul High School, I see children who are brilliant, but for various reasons are not provided the steps that they need to achieve what they're capable of achieving. Mm -hmm. that, that's where my heart is. Thank you. I appreciate you for coming today. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. I did see a couple other hands, but trust me, this is an interactive conversation, so we will be able to get back to it. So context setting, the need for equity. Rec uh, raise your hand if you recognize this photo. Curious. OK, so it seems like most people here are aware of this photo. Um, can I have an audience member lift up the context? What is this photo? Um, the Little Rock Nine, yeah, the, the fight for integration in, 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 in public education. Um, you know, when I first heard this, I was really shocked, first and foremost. I mean, I was a, I was a 4.4 GPA student coming out of a really small city. I was an international baccalaureate student, you know, um, so I was well, uh, well ingrained in I don't know if you call it academic culture, but just like I took the most rigorous courses, like, and I love to learn. But I didn't learn about this until I got to college as a freshman. And it wasn't until I was taking courses in African American history that I learned this story. Um, and so, you know, just, just hearing about uh, Governor, Governor Farbus, who was a Democratic governor, which I thought was interesting, uh, but, but to hear how he used his power and his authority in government to push an agenda that disproportionately impacted students of color. Um, I mean, that was, that really hit me right here. And then to go on to graduate school and, and, and 
pursue a master's in sociology, I would learn more about the history of, of American public education and how it's traditionally been used to sort and assimilate students based on their identity, based on their background, based on where they come from. Um, this is an unfortunate reality that we all need to, um, to appreciate if we're going to be able to move forward, if we're going to be able to redesign uh, public education systems so that they support all students, and if we're going to give every student the opportunity um, to go through that, uh, that rite of passage that we call education. Now, I mentioned earlier that I work for uh, the Council of Chief State School Officers. For those of you that are unfamiliar, uh, CCSSO is a national membership association, and our members are states. And in particular, the chief or the head of public elementary or secondary education that's responsible for the education system for an entire state. So we work with those folks, those chiefs, and we recently released a document called Leading for Equity because we wanted to really push on this issue of educational equity. What are ways that chiefs, meaning uh, state government, what are ways that they can support folks on the local level, folks like you all in the room, um, in advancing educational equity and making sure that students are supported no matter their race, their gender, or any other form of identity that they bring with them into the classroom. As a matter of fact, we want to celebrate those differences because that's what makes us so strong. Um, but that's, that's at the state level, right? We know that at the core of this work, the heart of it is exactly where you are. It's in the classroom. It's in the school. It's in that district. So one of our um, National Teachers of the Year from CCSSO, uh, her name is Sydney. She's a social justice uh, curriculum teacher. She created her own social justice curriculum, and through that uh, social justice curriculum, she was able to connect with her students who looked very different from her, and she was able to build that trust, build that sense of community, and give them a sense of ownership and agency over their lives and over their education. So I would love to share a quick video um, featuring her, and then we can have a conversation about educational equity in the classroom. And so they agree, and the judge makes the decision that she's not going to allow the three pieces of evidence to be presented to the jury. And so we read through this, and immediately the kids have all sorts of reactions. Um, even just when the name is given on our own stuff, and they see that in the headlines, they all of a sudden are making all these connections and they're saying, oh, I know about that case, I know about him, and they start to share and I'll say, okay, well, what do you know about the case, and what do you know about him, and, and what are my pieces of food when you hear this news? We read the article, and then they have all kinds of questions. And so first we go through and we just talk about comprehension, right? What's happening here, right? So they know they're like, hitting all these issues of social justice, and we're going to talk about equity, and we're going to talk about bias. We're also just hitting all kinds of ELA things, right? So we're, we're analyzing the text, and we're building academic language and vocabulary and all that. Um, and so then we talk about, okay, how does this article help us understand the concept of bias? In what way does this judge's decision have to do with the issue of bias? And I get kids to dig in a little bit to, oh, all right, so if this evidence had been presented, what kind of biases might that have led them to in the jury mind? Or what kind of biases does it show that the evidence has been considered in the first place as relevant to the case, as relevant to what happened with that? Um, and so that takes up probably, I would say, 45 minutes one day in the first month of school. But it really sets the tone for kids that, okay, what we're doing is English and history, and we're learning about Columbus, and we're learning about bias, and we're learning vocabulary, and we're reading, and we're finding evidence in the text, and doing all those things that you normally think that you do in a history class, but at the same time, we're connecting to very real current events about things that you're already thinking about, that you're interested in, that you have questions about, that you're angry about, that you want to do something about. And in that way, I see that as a lesson that's really important about this. Because we're building vocabulary and we're talking about these issues of equity that sometimes um, I think people think aren't aren't welcome in the classroom or too controversial in the classroom or oh, we shouldn't touch that because that's going to be on the tangent and how will we ever get back. But that can be really exemplified um, for social justice education. 
Yeah, and, and another thing you left Mike is talks about the consistent of agency. Like how do you take what kids are learning in the classroom and give them a way to apply it to their sense of themselves and their sense of their connection to their community. So my next question is since starting this curriculum, right? What changes have you seen in your students? Yeah, yeah. So I mean I think something that happens is like kids come into ninth grade and they see me in the front of the classroom. And I'm a young woman, and there are all, this, all these assumptions about who I'm going to be or who I'm not going to be for them. Because my students are primarily of color, um, and our, city, our school is right in Boston, right in the city. And I think they probably have a lot of white teachers, a lot of white female teachers. And so immediately, I think there's this sense of like, all right, well, who is this woman? Can I trust her? What's going on here? Is this going to be more of the same? And so I think we start to actually talk about justice and injustice. We start to break that down. When I show them that, you know, listen to what I have to say, and that I'm interested in them being experts in the classroom, and I'm interested in us really digging into things that are hard and uncomfortable, I think I change that to be pretty early on so that they get surprised by that. And they think, oh, okay, so we're actually going to talk about this stuff. And I think that that does help to build some trust and a sense of relationship in the community, which then will lead them to taking more academic risks in the classroom, which I think when they see the academic risk, they're going to learn the kind of school, uh, the kind of skills and the kind of knowledge that they can put in their toolbox to change the world. So when we're 14 years old and we're talking about bias and we're talking about this court case and evidence and what's relevant and what's not and what that means, and then we're going to talking about apartheid in South Africa, we're talking about protest movements and how young people in South Africa are protesting injustice. The kids start to put these things together and they start to link them together and they're changing their life. Oh. I'm just like those kids in my life. And some of these injustices that we're talking about, and some of these inequities that we're talking about, happen not only in the history that we're studying, but I can see them in my world today. So maybe if I connect the dots there, I might be someone who has some power and some agency to do something about the inequity in the world today. And I think that seed gets planted in the ninth grade. And then the great thing about my school, like I told you about the beginning, is that I've been working on this. And so each year, sort of expanding out, just like deepening it, they're putting more schools in that toolbox. And by the time we get to the senior year, they're working on something called the Social Justice Action Project, where they're picking a topic um, of a current inequity or injustice issue in the world that they want to address, and they're coming up with some ideas of how they might actually address it and take action in the world. Um, it's just a super cool way to empower kids yeah. who want to see that their voices matter. So um, that was quite a lot. Um, she talked about bringing uh, relevant topics such as Trayvon Martin and, and bias into the classroom and giving students a chance to express their voice and say, hey, this connects to uh, my real life. Um, this connects to things that I've heard in the news. Um, and the interest of time, from current slide, um, we do have to move on to the next part of this, the discussion, but I just want to say quickly, by a quick show of hands, how many of you have organized or implemented a lesson um, kind of like what Sydney has described. Great. How many of you would like to but you haven't found the resources to help you do that or you feel like there's something that's in your way that would prevent you from doing that? Okay, great. All right. Well, well I will now turn it over to Don and we will take on a quick exercise. Want to help me, Mark? Pass some of these on. What I'm handing out now are the INA call booklet on equity that those of us who went to Denver. And look, you have one too, yes. There were four subgroups that we were divided into meeting students where they are, student voice, policy, yeah, thank you. and then. Equity. You folks don't see any copies, right? Try that one. Any more, Mark, up here? A text protocol, if, especially if you're doing this with your administrative team or others, is to give a couple of pages for you folks to read. And I'd like to have you just take a couple of minutes. It won't be enough time. But if you take a look at pages five through seven in the booklet, and try to come up with something that highlights of interest to you. We won't do the rest of it, 
I was going to say, underlying two concerns that you discovered, prepare to share one insight. Find something in there that goes, hmm, I need to share this with the rest of them. I'm going to interrupt and start a discussion. And it is one thing that you found interesting to share with the rest of us, or worth sharing with the rest of us. And I've seen people turn pages, do the underlining. And all I can say on behalf of Bryant and myself is that this whole booklet provoked some very deep conversations over those three days in Denver. In fact, the equity discussion overran all the other discussions for the whole three days. And here's my confession. I am from the elite and privileged. And the question I have for you, the elephant in the room, will the elite and privileged allow an equitable experience for all children in school? Will that happen? Brian, if you could go back to your fence slides, because the elite and the privileged have all those boxes stacked up, and here they are. Do you think they want to give up any of those boxes? In a capitalistic system, it's competitive, it's cutthroat. I'm not going to give up my advantage. When Maine went to a proficiency-based diploma, the biggest pushback we got was from the highly educated, articulate, squeaky wheel parents who learned how to play the game and they didn't want us to change the rules. Quote, no more extra credit. Demonstrate a performance, demonstrate a proficiency. What does that mean? The kid's voice decides <coughs> what evidence looks like. Not me as a teacher. I provoked the compelling question. The kid works with peers and comes up with a response. Totally different than what I expect. That's an opportunity to learn, an opportunity to produce evidence that's a little different than what the status quo, spray and pray, two page paper evidence of proficiency used to look like. If you could go back to the other slide, Brent. My confession is that after 43 years, I get introduced to uh, a mirror that said, Don, have you been doing this right? And I worked at Hall High School last year, and it caused me to do some very serious reflection about how kids learn. So here's my personal mantra. You build a relationship with kids first. You make curriculum relevant their curriculum. Make it for them, not your curriculum, not the district's curriculum. Curriculum has to be as nimble and flexible as every different kid in your room. I watched a social studies teacher in ninth grade have 23 kids right here in the middle of his hand. He was talking about the amendments of the Constitution. What do you think was relevant? Search and seizure. It was alive. It was well done. It was intense. Those kids were involved in the skits. They were involved in acting, in demonstrating proper behavior to the police. And on it went. And then he went to the next one. And it was a skit of uh, Harborage, where the, the armed services could come into your house and take over and sleep in your bed and eat your food. And they said, no way, that's going to happen in my house. No. And then they got into the skit and they said, it was during the beginning of our country and it had a context, it had a lens that was different than today's lens. But they had to discuss it. And it was deep and it was intense and it was level four taxonomy. It wasn't regurgitation of facts, figures, dates, names, faces, and places. It was real, honest reactions. It was changing my persona. And some of the mantras that we all have, those six words that describe us, 
The saying is that all kids can learn to high levels. Success begets success, and schools control the variables. Think of the variables we control. We control the curriculum. We control the right answer. We control the schedule. We control the food. We control... How do we teach kids to make decisions? They are dependent on us. They leave school. Uh, let me get into relevancy first. Oh my God, relevancy. If the curriculum isn't relevant, this is my research, my learning. Hattie and Yates, visible learning and the science of how we learn. I saw it in social studies, here it is. All learning is based on prior knowledge. Okay, here's a mental trip for you. I'm going to give you a picture in your brain of how the brain works to store information. Think of the skylight of New York. Every one of those towers is a different concept. And it's a pile of checkers. And every time I talk about something, you go, oh, that one is activated. I know, I know I'm going to put more information over here. I've got a skyscraper that I can put it in. I've got it over here. Those kids have a level playing field. They don't have skyscrapers. They don't have differentiated contexts or accumulation of learning. There's no place to store that information. Quote, how long does information stay within your brain system? Five to 20 seconds. Working knowledge. If I can't have a place to put it, it stays here for about five to 20 seconds. I leave the room, it's gone. Don't ask me to repeat it next class or next Friday during the test, it's gone. I need a place to store it. I need prior knowledge where to put that stuff. And these kids come to school with Maslow's hierarchy alive and well. You're asking me to diagram a sentence? I'm thinking of where I'm sleeping tonight. I need to make curriculum relevant. In my conversation with Susan Patrick at Ina Call and Chris Sturgis at Competency Works is, we gotta personalize our instruction and customize it, but we also have to be nimble with our curriculum. We can't have the district curriculum. We have to have some unnegotiable standards in each course, and we gotta figure out how to make it relevant for each child in the room. Until we do that, we're just going through the motions. We're just going through the motions. And for the last four years, I've been in classes all through New England, here in Arkansas, and when I see a teacher connect with the relevancy, kids leave the room in a buzz. They're talking about it all the way down the hallway. When your curriculum is transparent and they know what's expected of you, and the difference is how you present it to make it relevant for them, then education happens. So my confession is, I haven't done enough of this. My promise is that everything I do from now on is gonna be about equity. And it's not just about race. It's about gender. It's about religion. I grew up in Waterville, Maine. I'm a Catholic. I wasn't allowed to go to the French Catholic Church. I'm Polish. What? I didn't even realize that till I was married. Bryant realized it when he went to college. I realized it when I got married because there were two Catholic churches side by side. We couldn't use the other parking lot. What? And it was, str I didn't understand that. And can you imagine what kids don't understand about our reality? Wow, we must be a bunch of jerks. And, and I'm asking them to build a relationship with me and they think, have a clue about their life? I mean, we got some serious conversations to have. Mm -hmm. And the serious conversations are one at a time. Transformation happens with one conversation <coughs> at a time. So with this, our resources, yeah, social absolutely. justice standards, our framework, uh, competency-based education from Ina Call. Ina Call and CCSSO are taking a lead in moving forward with 
it being a topic of conversation in everything that we do. So here are some resources, and I recommend this book because it was transformational for me, especially the second half where it talked about how the brain actually operates and how kids who are overloaded and overstressed even before they come to school really can't process what it is that we're trying to share with them. Just can't do it. And until we get relevant, they're not even going to build a relationship with us. So I think some of the stuff that we do has to be kid-friendly, not just peer acceptable. And our curriculum has to be written in kid words. And it has to be friendly enough for them to interpret it. And it has to be aligned with their life. Brian? Thanks, Don. Yeah, I just want to um, piggyback um, on everything that uh, Don was talking about. These are just a few resources that I would recommend um, since working in uh, the education policy space. Most of these resources are from Teaching Tolerance, and if you'll see, this is actually a screenshot of Teaching Tolerance topics page. So if there's a different top, a certain topic like religion, like you don't know how to address some of the tension between maybe your Christian students and your students who practice a different faith. Um, class, immigration, gender and sexual identity, all of these have different resources on Teaching Tolerance's page you can go through. You can even create a learning plan for your students based off of this. Um, ones I wanted to pull to the forefront because of recent conversations that have been happen happening nationally, um, the teaching about race, racism and police violence is an exceptional resource to help teachers make those connections with students and make the curriculum relevant, as is uh, Immigrant and Refugee Children, a Guide for Educators and School Support Staff. Um, and then for those of you who feel like you might be in a, a bit more of an uphill battle, um, not necessarily in the classroom, but on the administrative, stop, administrative side, Teaching Tolerance has a social justice standards and anti-bias framework, right? So it's a way to show, look, at the third grade level, here's a way that you can teach social justice and it still be tied to a framework, and it could t still be tied to a standard. Here's how it looks at the sixth grade level. Here's how it looks at the ninth grade level. And this, here's how it looks as a, a person ready for college or career post uh, graduation. So these are just a number of resources. I'm gonna be around tomorrow at 11 a.m. If you wanted to check in with me as far as a mentoring session is concerned, I'd be happy to work with you. Um, I don't know the exact room, but it should be on the app. So if you look on the app, you can find me. Um, it's tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, so with that, we want to say thank you so much for coming. If you have any additional questions or if you want a copy of the slides, you can email me uh, at bryant.best at ccsso.org, uh, my colleague Don, and uh, Dennis Arola from the University of Arkansas who helped us put this presentation together. So thank you so much for attending, you all. Have a great day. <laughs>